Good morning, Calvary Baptist Church. I hope that you're having a great and wonderful day, and I hope you enjoyed uh, Resurrection Day last week as you got to celebrate the Lord's victory over death, hell, and the grave. And today we are going to uh, go into a, a, a special sermon, uh, a special lesson, a uh, special message, uh, because we we have such an awesome opportunity today here at Calvary. And I hope that uh, if you're watching this early enough, uh, you will have the opportunity to come here in person uh, because we are going to be baptizing two of our, our young men and uh, looking forward to that. Um, and so I hope that you'll come out and to support them. Um, but today we're going to be looking at baptism. Um, you know, it's been a while since we've had uh, baptism here at the church. Uh, at least this is the first one of the year. And uh, so we're looking forward to that. But it's been a while since I've had the opportunity to talk about uh, one of the two uh, ordinances that we have uh, as far as a Southern Baptist Church. Uh, we, we have communion, and we, we celebrate that uh, on Resurrection Day. And the Lord's Supper, we remember His death until He comes. And it is something that was instituted by Jesus Himself. And, and baptism is also another one of the things that, that Jesus instituted um, is He gave the Great Commission. He told us to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, but, you know, you might be having questions. Maybe, maybe you're somebody who's been baptized and you were baptized a long time ago. Uh, maybe you're somebody who, who has been afraid to be baptized because maybe you have a fear of water or what is that all about? Do I really need to be baptized? What's the point? And so I'm calling today's uh, message, Baptism, the Ins and Outs and What It's All About. And yes, that does sound a little cheesy and corny, but it is straight to the point. Um, of what we're talking about in water baptism. You know, Baptists as a whole, what we're known for is the fact that we believe in baptism by immersion. Um, we don't sprinkle, we don't pour on a baby's head, we don't do infant baptism, we do believer's baptism. That we only baptize after somebody has, has confessed the Lord, has said that yes, they have asked Jesus to be their Lord and Savior, that they are doing it as the next step in obedience to Jesus in their life. And, and so I want us to take a look at baptism, what it is, why we do it, where it came from, what its purpose is, um, to dispel some of the questions, because some people uh, have the thought that you have to be baptized to be saved. And and I believe there's there's evidence, uh, tons of evidence in the scripture that, that says that that is not necessarily true. In fact, that is not true. Um, but, you know, as we look at this, we need to understand what it's about. Because even though it's not necessary for salvation, it is important. It is it is a, a, a part of the Christian faith that I think that you will be remiss if you left it out. And so let's take a look at this. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to look at the guy whose name is we is synonymous with baptism, and we're going to look at John the Baptist. And so Matthew chapter 3, and we're going to start in verse 1. Matthew 3, starting verse 1. God's Word tells us this. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. And then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the regions around the Jordan came out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. But when, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his, bapti to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance, and do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is his hand, and he will, he, he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
So as we look at this, this is kind of a, a strong passage that we see from John as he is out there and he is baptizing and the the people were, were asking, you know, who he was, and, and he's, you know, he's the voice crying out in the wilderness, make path the, the, the straight the paths for the Lord. And, and we look at this, and, and this is so important. He was the herald of Jesus. He was preparing the people that they would be ready to receive the message that Jesus had brought. And the the Pharisees and the, the scribes and these guys that came out to see him. Now, this is kind of amazing because Remember back when Jesus was born and the the uh, wise men came in, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they, they heard that, oh yeah, the one who could be born as Messiah was, was born. They could not be bothered to go out and investigate. But here's this guy who was starting to become more popular than them. And everybody in Jerusalem, Judea, was coming out to see John and hear him preach and to be baptized and into repentance and that sort of stuff and and oh they had to come out they had to investigate because that's their job it only mattered to them when their popularity was at stake and we see that that when john sees them he calls them a brood of vipers he is he is calls them for what they are and we also see he gives them a warning because you know he we we know we see so many times that the pharisees hated jesus that they constantly butted heads with him. But he was warning them, hey, you know, who who warned you guys that, that, that your your judgment was coming? You know, be be a tree that produces good fruit because the Lord is is got the axe at the roots and he's ready to cut down the tree if the tree doesn't start producing some good fruit. And so he was warning them, you guys have got you are off base, you are not doing what you ought to do. You need to be listening. You need to be checking yourselves. And so he was warning them before Jesus ever got on the scene that they needed to check themselves. And so we see that that John is out there. He is he is baptizing with, with water, and he is baptizing unto repentance. He is not baptizing to save people from their sins. He is just baptizing by, by letting people understand they are sinners. They, they have broken the law of, of God. They have done wrong. And they are asking forgiveness, and they are bat- being baptized as a a demonstration, saying, "I am turning from my sinful ways, and I am I am aiming to do right by the Lord." And so he's he's baptizing with water, but we see that that he knows that the one that's going to come after him, he, his sandals, he's not worthy to carry. He's saying, "I baptize with water," but he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And we see that it says his winnowing fan is at in his hand. And he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor, gather his wheat into his barn, and he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. He is saying, hey, those that are, are for him, he is going to gather up and he is going to put in his barn. You know, he is going to care for the good crop. But the chaff, the the the, the faulty crop, the, the leftovers, the rest is going to be burned up. And so it's once again a warning to the Pharisees, hey, get your acts together. Um, but they, they didn't get it. Now, I want us to continue on, verse 13, because we see Jesus shows up on the scene. He, he is asking to be baptized by John. And, and so why, why is this important? Why is baptism such a, a key element? Why is this so important to Jesus? And let's see this. Verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed uh, Then he allowed him. And, he, and when he was baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So why was Jesus baptized? You know, we, we just talked about the, the water baptism was was talking about seeking repentance from sin and that sort of thing why was jesus being baptized so important well number one is he was doing it as a sign of submission to the authority of his father you know this is this is one of the things that jesus did is he is he is coming to earth to live a human life to to give up his life on the cross and so he is he is showing his submission to his father's plan 
and we see that, that God, the Father, is pleased with the Son. We also see that he is, Jesus is setting an example for us. Um, this, is, this is something that we, he is giving a, a symbol of what is going to be happening. Because the baptism is a symbol. It is, is showing our being united with Jesus, but also it is a picture of his mission here on earth. His coming to earth, his, his dying, his rising again, his walking in newness of life. Um, it is a, a symbol of that. And so Jesus is, is being baptized that we would have his example to follow. And so there's so many different things that's going on here. But John is is right in in a sense is he's saying you know I am a, I have done wrong I am not perfect I need to be baptized by you Jesus and and that is true John recognized his own failings in the presence of Jesus and so yes this is this is true ba baptism is not does not make us perfect does not forgive us of sins it does not actually wash our sins away this is the work of Jesus himself and so I I love the fact that. Jesus is that baptism that we have that is our example because it is because of his work that we are saved. So you might be asking yourself, what is baptism exactly? Well, turn with me, if you would, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, and we're going to be in verse 4. And you might want to put a marker there in your Bible uh, on Romans chapter 6 because we'll be back here later um, as we look a little bit deeper into baptism. So verse 4 says, Therefore we, are, we are, were buried with him through baptism into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And so it is an identification with Jesus. We are, we are identifying with his, his uh, through baptism into his death. And so as we are put under the water, it is as we are dying to ourself, as we are dying to sin, as we are being raised up as, as our resurrection and then to come out of the water is to walk in newness of life, to, to have a different outset, a different uh, mindset, a different spiritual life in us that we are identifying with. Now, the other thing of it is, though, is, is baptism is a picture of an inward decision that has already been made. You know, it is not baptism that saves you. It isn't baptism that says, okay, Lord, forgive me of my sins. It is somebody who has already been saved saying, hey, I want to walk in obedience to my Savior. I want to follow his example. I want to publicly declare I am aligning my life. I'm identifying with Jesus and everything that he said and did. And so this is what baptism is, is it's a public declaration of our faith. It is a reminder to ourselves that we are we are buried with him. Our old man has been buried in, in death with Jesus because of his death on the cross, that we are no longer slaves to the old man. Um, so we, we can conquer sin. We don't have to live bound to sin any longer because of what Jesus did on the cross, that we can walk in that newness of life, that all things have become new. And so it is a reminder to us. You know, the ordinances are meant to be reminders. We do the Lord's Supper, and we do it to remember his sacrifice on the cross. Baptism is we are publicly identifying with, with Jesus, his people, and we are reminding ourselves that we are dead to our sins, that we are walking in newness of life, and that we have the ability through the Holy Spirit in that new life to, to conquer sin in our life, to, to not fall prey to it. But what is... what? isn't baptism. You know, so many people have this view, and, and there's there's even denominations that teach that you have to be baptized to be saved and all this sort of stuff. And, and I want us to take a look at this because I, I think it's important to see that that is not so. You know, one of one of the examples that, that comes to mind is, is the thief on the cross that Jesus promises will be with him in paradise. Um, you know, he did not have the opportunity to be baptized or anything of that nature. He was he was dying there on the cross beside Jesus, and, and Jesus said, "Today you will be with me in paradise." That he was he was forgiving him of his sins and and saving him right then and there. But I want us to take a look at this 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 passage here in Acts chapter ten because we're going to be looking at Cornelius and the, the basically the first Gentile Christians. And so verse 34, it says, 
Um, and, and just to give a little background, this is uh, Peter had uh, been staying at, in Caesarea and, and uh, or not Caesarea, but he was uh, he was in uh, Joppa, I believe. And uh, he was he was uh, he was staying in, in Joppa by, uh, I believe it was Simon the Tanner's house. And he was had a vision uh, while he was on the rooftop of, of the Lord letting down sheets with all these animals. And, and, and the Lord basically says, what I have created, don't call unclean. Now, I think that this part of this was, yes, talking about food, that, that Peter was going to be in the presence of Gentiles. He might have to eat things that are not necessarily what he would normally eat. Um, but it also helped him to understand that even the Gentiles, God did not create to be unclean. They are his creation. They are. And so when, when these people from Cornelius from Caesarea, uh, he he sent some men to come get Peter because he was told in a vision to go get him. And Peter went willingly with them. And so he had been talking and explaining how, you know, this was an un unusual thing. But then Peter goes to talk about Jesus. And, th and that's where we're at in verse 34. And then, so verse 34, it says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality. But in every nation whom fears him, when works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. That word you know, which was uh, proclaimed throughout all Judea and began from Galilee after the, um, after the baptism which John preached. How God appointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all the things which he did, both in land and of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they killed by hanging on a tree. Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he was ordained by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins." Now, this is incredibly important. I want us to see this right here. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word, and those of circumcision who believed were astonished as many came with Peter because of the gift of the Holy Spirit that had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay a few days. Now you might be saying, well, they were baptized. Yes, they were. But did you see the order of events? They were saved and received the gift of the Holy Spirit because they believed that Jesus was the one who was sent. And so their, their belief, their faith is what, what saved you know, in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, you know, it's for grace are we saved through faith, that not of works of righteousness, which we have done, lest any man should boast. You know, it is it is not a thing that we do to save us. It has got nothing to do with us. It has everything with what to do with what Jesus did on the cross. His dying, his, his, uh, his, his saving us, his resurrection from the dead. That is what, that is what is bring salvation. It is nothing of us. And so baptizing does not make us believer. It shows that we already are one. Baptized, baptism doesn't save us from our sins. It is the work of Jesus on the cross that saves us of our sins. Baptism is the first act of obedience in following Jesus because he tells us to be baptized. He tells us to baptize others as we, as we go. So why do we do it? Well, as I said, in Matthew 28, we're going to see that Jesus tells us to do it. And and I, I honestly can't think of a more appropriate or better reason of why we do an ordinance rather than Jesus tells us to do it. And that's why we have the ordinances of uh, baptism and, and the Lord's Supper, because Jesus told us to do it. And so if he told us to do it, it is it is not a... If we feel like it, if, we, if we're if we not this or that, Jesus told us to do it, so we ought to do it. And so let's see this. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. 
And this is as before Jesus was, was uh, uh, taken back to heaven. He says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He is, he is telling us to baptize. And not only that, but he's telling us to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Also, as is an illustration of Jesus' baptism, when both the Father through his voice, the Spirit through his, his presence, and Jesus physically being there, all three were present at the same time. And so when we baptize, we, we ask the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be present at that baptism. It is following in the Lord's footsteps, is asking that we, we need the, the help of all three. We need the salvation of Jesus. We need the, 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 the provision of our Heavenly Father. And we need the help and assistance of the Holy Spirit that helps, helps guide our life, all three, in, in walking in this newness of life. You know, we don't just need one function of God. We need all of, of the persons of God to, to help us to live the life that is going to be honoring to God. And so, you know, as we have baptism, we think about it. You know, as, as people come into the water, they, they, are, they are symbolizing their belief in Jesus' death on the cross for our sins. And that's one of the things that I ask when I baptize is, is I ask, do you, have you asked Jesus to forgive you of your sins? Have you, do, you, do you believe you're a sinner? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins? Do you know that he, he died and rose again? And I ask these questions before I baptize. As I put somebody under the water, I, I, I tell them I, I baptize you as my brother or my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you know, buried with him in likeness of his death. And then we raise them out of the water and rise to walk in newness of life. And so we, we believe in the victory of Jesus over the, over the grave. And, and we symbolize that by the coming out of the water, that he came out of the grave, just as we celebrated uh, last week on Resurrection Day. And then as they walk out of the, the water, that they're walking in that newness of life that, that, that we're told about and that we see in the scripture that the old man has died and he's been nailed to the cross and, and we walk in newness of life, that all things have become new. And so we, we have this and it is a symbol to not only to us, but those who are around us. We are identifying with Jesus and is, is meant as a reminder to us, you know, some some major events in a, a person's Christian walk is, you know, when they get saved, when, when the Lord has saved them from their sins. You know, I can remember when I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins. I was I was a little boy on uh, when when I was, a, you know, I think I was like eight or nine years old. And, and I remember hearing the sermon and, and, and th asking questions. I asked my dad questions in that morning. Hey, what did he mean by this? And what is this? And I remember praying out on my my family's old little brown couch, you know, those 80s brown sofa furniture things. I can't even remember the smell of the cushions as I was praying there and I was crying. I was asking Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. I am sorry for what I've done. And I, I remember that. I also remember when I was baptized because I was I was afraid of water. I wasn't baptized until I was 11, almost 12 years old, I was baptized by, by a pastor that I think the world of, and he, is, he has since went on to, to go home to be with the Lord, but I remember Jim Downey, and he, he baptized me, and, and I remember that whole situation. I remember looking out at my church and, and, and telling them, yes, I believe in Jesus. I have, I have given my heart to him, and I want to follow him. And yes, I, I don't swim. I am terrified of water. It was a scary event, but you know what? We did it. And that was a great thing. And you know, I remember these things. And we, we, we constantly do have communion. We constantly remind ourselves of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. You know, these are important events. And they help remind us that we have been bought with a price. That, that Jesus has come to forgive us of our sins, to save us, and that we owe him everything. So what does baptism truly represent? I told you to stick your finger back there in uh, Romans chapter 6. Um, if not, turn back with me back to Romans chapter 6, and uh, we're going to be in verse 
1 through 14. I want us to read that whole section because we really truly see what baptism is all about. And so as, as Paul's writing this, he's writing to the Romans, and, he's, and people were, were going, well, if God's grace covers all of our sins, should we just sin so grace is more? And this is what he writes. He says, verse 1, What then shall we say, or what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been united together in likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin may be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died has been made freed from sin." Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Likewise, you also reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin. But present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead, and that your members are as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall, have not, shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. And so it is assembled that we have, we have put aside our former life. It is there to remind us that we are no longer bound to sin, that we have died to sin, that that is no longer who we are, that we can have victory over sin. You know, this is, this is so important. Our, our, our world loves to have sin that entangles people. There's so many vices and so many things that are out there that, that, that just, just bring people into addiction to them and these things. And God is saying, hey, you don't have to stay addicted to those things. You don't have to continue to fall. If you've given your heart to me, if, if, if I have saved you, you are freed from that. And that you can have victory. And so it is there to remind us. It is there to, re to represent that we, are, we have died to our old life. That we have walked in newness of life. And it, so it is a powerful reminder that because of what Jesus did, we no longer have to be slaves to sin. We don't have to follow sin any longer. That we can put our hope and trust in the Lord and that we can do good. You know, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by His resurrection... Um, by by of Jesus by the resurrection of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit we have the ability to do good to do actual good not self serving good or or good so we get praise of others that we can be selfless and serve people because the Lord would would have us to do so you know I, I remember when I was in in university I went to a psychology class and he was talking about altruism and altruism is just doing good for the simple fact of doing good. And and he asked, well, who believes in this? And, and I absolutely raised my hand. Yes, I absolutely believe in doing good for the sake of doing good because of my belief in Jesus, that, that to love people, to care about people, to do good for people, just, just to show the love of Jesus is absolutely something that people can do. But he said, no, alt altruism always has, it's always, it always gives the person a rush or it, it always has some sort of, uh, of selfish thing buried underneath. And so me and him had a big disagreement about this. And so it was, it was, the world just cannot see good for the sake of good because that's, that's not the world, the way the world works. But in walking in newness of life and walking in that, that new life we have with Jesus, yes, that is absolutely possible. And so this is the thing that, that says, hey, we're not bound by selfish, fleshy desires anymore. We don't have to do that. We are not bound to it. We are not under its sway that we can follow under Jesus. We can walk in spirit and in truth. And this is awesome. This is what the Holy Spirit empowers us to do. This is what we, we have because of the redemptive work of Jesus. And this is what we want to do to please our Heavenly Father. You know, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we have the ability to call 
Father God, God, the, the creator God, Abba Father, to call him Daddy. And I don't know about you, but I, I still, even, even at my age of, of 38 years old, I still love to make my dad happy. I still love to make him proud and, and say, you know, hey, I raised my son right. He's making wise choices, making wise decisions. He is, he is living a life for the Lord. That still brings me joy to make my dad happy. And so is one of the things that brings us joy in our in our in our walk with the Lord is to make our heavenly father happy to do things that that he he smiles at and he says you know well done good and faithful servant you know well done good job you are you are being a, a great example of my son and his his work on the cross and that is that is what our goal is and so, as I said, we have the opportunity to have baptism this Sunday here at Calvary. And, and I encourage you to come out and, and, and celebrate with our, our young men that, that are, are being baptized and, and pray for them. You know, they are publicly saying that my old life of doing whatever I want is at an end. And these, these two young men are very, very young. And that is a very bold statement to make, so young. But they, they you know, both of them want to follow the Lord, want to do follow the example of their Savior. And so I am so pleased and have the privilege of doing this for them. And I hope that you'll be able to come out and, and do that. But if not, if, if you just cannot be here, I, I encourage you, say a prayer for these young men. Um, say a prayer for, for them. Lord knows who they are, and He will honor your prayers. But absolutely pray for them that they would they would live a life that... that follows into the conviction that they have now in such a young age and uh, pray that they would just continue to stay faithful to the Lord throughout their life and that they would remember this day, the day that they were baptized, the day that they said, I am no longer bound by sin, but I am looking to live my life in a way that is honoring to God. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I hope you have a great and wonderful day. And I hope that if you ha had some questions about baptism that this maybe helped answer some of them for you. Well, thank you so much. God bless you all, and we'll see you next time.